there are lots of uh, there are a lot of fine fine examples of that, uh, but but maybe that's it, it's it's a terribly terribly important part of uh, our constitutional arrangement, and it requires what it requires a system of making laws, a system of applying laws, persons to apply laws, and power to appoint persons to apply laws. So we're building a state right here, just in order to make sure that the declarations that come out in a democratic state actually uh, are matched by the behavior of those who hold power. It's a lovely idea. And that's, so the statecraft point I'm making is, you have to work out things that make the ideal work. Uh, and we're not perfect at that, but we certainly try. The third uh, concept of, uh, of a statecraft is this. It's a constitution. We're, we're trying to constitute something. We need to be alert to what our society needs to be constituted. And when we, as Canada did uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, decide that we needed to think about our constitution, the number one requirement of all was be alert, pay attention. Where are we? What matters to us? What do we want to predict as, a, as, a, as the core of our civility, our democracy, our justice as we move forward? Don't put things behind just because they are at the edge of our consciousness. They may be the things that, we, that describe exactly where we want to be. Indigenous rights, gender equality, uh, perhaps uh, uh, a different method of, of appointing judges, uh, but and uh, and perhaps we want to put in there uh, a many processes which are fully democratic, or maybe we don't. But we need to think about that. And so, what happens in constitution making is the requirement, where are we? What are we now seeing as the constituted justice of our system? And are we ca capturing it in our constitution? And that, that, that little problem was in spades in, in the constitutional negotiations we're talking of. It was, it was there every minute of the day, that question. Are we capturing what needs to be captured about our ideas of living justly together? So that, that, that I think is a good spot for me to jump in again. And we'll come obviously to the patriation negotiations shortly. Uh, but there's, there's an idea that I want to use uh, to try and bring some of these different threads together. And it's actually your idea, uh, fittingly. Um, so you said something um, in uh, a recent podcast that was released as part of this Legacies of Patriation project. Uh, and to paraphrase those comments, uh, you said constitution making is a remedial task. Uh, it's not about mm. creating something. It's not about uh, brainstorming. It's about recognizing and responding to fundamental national urgent problems. And uh, my question is, how do these comments uh, relate to your understanding of constitution making as statecraft? And, and the people of the nation want it to be in. It's, 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 it's to... Pay, pay attention, I've used that phrase before. Pay attention, see what matters, see what matters to communities, see what matters to individuals, see what matters to enterprises, and see what matters to office holders and to people who are trying to be effective and efficient, uh, see what matters to businesses, and, uh, and try and capture the structure of power that allows the things that matter to as many people as possible happen. I think so, John, I think we lost you for a second. I hope we didn't. I hope that everyone heard what you were saying and not what I was saying. Um, I should mention, by the way, uh, just before we go any further, that if you do have any questions, please post them in the, the Q&A section uh, and we'll do our best to, to circle back to them. I know that we started late and we're a, a bit pushed for time, but uh, we'll try and take as many questions as we can. 
uh, what what I was was going to say before was I just wanted to to raise something that you said during a, a podcast that the the Center for Constitutional Studies put out recently, uh, which I think is really poignant and really uh, useful for drawing the the different threads of what we're talking about together. Uh, and what you said is that constitution making is a remedial task. Uh, it's not about creating something. It's not about brainstorming. It's about recognizing and responding to fundamental national gnawing problems. And I was wondering if you could um, maybe talk a bit about how that relates to your understanding of constitution making as statecraft. Well, not only that the, the, the world is shifting and the interests of the people in the world are shifting all the time. And we are always looking for a sort of normative order which respects what matters to us and respects the relationships that we depend on in order to thrive. That is the relationships of comedy, the relationships of mutual support, the relationships of, of compromise and so forth. Uh, we, we want a constitution that is attentive to the way we are living together and the way we're not living together well enough and what we might do to make it better. So, so you know, in Canada, we're not living well as a nation. We're not underscoring our national pride, our nationhood. Uh, here are two reasons we're not doing well together. Uh, we had a relationship with Indigenous people, which was uh, homicidal. That, that's just not good. Um, and I don't mean it was indifference leading to homicide. There was real homicide going on there at times. And 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 and, uh, and 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 patronization and bureaucratization and everything that robs the soul of its worth. Uh, and so, and we know that we knew that we knew it had to be in the constitution. Um, secondly, I'm just another example is it is this that uh, we are a sovereign country. Our sovereignty has been hard won. And we may, may date it from the armistice in 1919, where Canada actually signed its own. Billions of Canadians killed and we get to sign. And, and I, we can be cynical about the price and the consequence, but it was, was wonderful. And, but we're not really sovereign because we uh, got consent from, from a colonial power to, to uh, shape our own uh, statecraft. Uh, and, 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 and this was so wrong in people's head that we, ever since 1930, we worked at this and failed and failed and failed. And um, so it's, it's remedial in the sense it is, it is response to a sense that we are not organizing power in our state and we're not prescribing relationships in our state in a way that reflects honestly who we are and who we hope to be and who we think that we can be if we could only somehow get a better polity in place. It's a great ambition for any group of people, any society to have. Can we have a better polity? So I, I, I want to come in there and, and come to patriation, um, thinking about patriation as a long form process. And you're obviously exceptionally well placed uh, to give us an insider's view on patriation uh, because you were a member of the Saskatchewan delegation during various negotiations that took place in the early 80s. Uh, and mm -hmm. for me, the, the really interesting thing uh, about the position that you're in is that your conception of statecraft seems like it maybe to some extent syncs up with uh, Trudeau's sort of pan-Canadian nationalism uh, more than it maybe does with the, the concession seeking of, of provinces like your own province of, of Saskatchewan. So mm -hmm. uh, is it fair to assume uh, that there is this sort of kinship between your view and Trudeau's instincts when it came to constitution making? And, and if there is, how did that play out for you as a member of the Saskatchewan delegation? Well, it, it, it played out fine and then it played out badly um, um well it played out fine in 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 the sense that um in the sense that uh trudeau uh, did have uh, three main objectives 
One was to create a sovereign nation in Canada. And another one is to take, to try and generate the economies of scale in the, in, in the economic commercial realm. That is that to, to, to generate a lot of economic mobility so that the benefits of efficiency here and, uh, and, and comparative uh, advantages, resources or whatever the hell they are, uh, would operate here. These, these are good plans. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a little bit concerned about uh, the economic capacity of your nation. And he was, uh, and he thought it was being uh, deprived by uh, a lot, lot of uh, parochial, eco, uh, essentially market regulation, protectionism. Uh, and uh, so he, he, he wanted uh, sovereignty and he wanted some kind of, uh, of uh, efficiency in the way we operate with each other as, a, as, a, as an economy. Uh, he had a, another, um, goal really it, it was that he, he wanted um uh in a way provinces to um work together more uh, maybe <laughs> maybe he wants centralized government in canada <laughs> there's a lot of suggestion that he did uh but he also wanted there to be an effective mechanism for uh, uh policies to develop which served a national purpose. Maybe he was thinking of childcare. No, that's his son. But he was thinking of something, uh, and uh, and that was good. Those are those are those are great, great objectives, uh, and and they would align with mine. Uh, they uh, aligned with the Saskatchewan government. Um, and, and I guess the other one I didn't, and obviously, sorry, I should have said the fourth one really would be, he, he wanted, he, he wanted legalized liberty, legalized freedom. He wanted people to the extent that it was appropriate, that's like a fairly big question, isn't it? What's appropriate? To the extent that it is appropriate to be free, to shape their own destiny, to seek their own redemptive strategies. And that's what we really, it's what we really we want. We want people to choose their own route to personal redemption and hence community redemption. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, he, he believed all that. So yes, uh, here's, here are some areas where there's like conflict. Blakeney went into these negotiations with maybe nothing so determined as to get back at those damn Supreme Court justices which struck down his uh, potash uh, 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 production uh, limit regime. Uh, Blakeney had the idea that, that potash was, was everywhere in the world and the markets were horrible and we invested a lot in it and we weren't gonna get uh, re returns on our investment. We needed a little bit of production regulation. We needed a little bit of monopoly behavior. Um, uh, uh, it, you know, Blakey was a wonderful idealist uh, in the sense that he was he was a smart idealist. And he understood the ideals of an open market, and then he understood the ide the ideals of not having an open market. And they're both and they're both right in the right circumstance. And he was smart enough, I think, to know the circumstances when they were right. And so he just slapped. Uh, pro rationing, pro ration on on production rationing that is on potash, and and then he also said, oh, the oil companies. By the way, you notice that they they sell to their parent at some rock bottom price, and then go into the market, into the world market, and sell at a high price. So they 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 take our oil, cheap, uh, and they sell it for a bundle, and we get nothing. And and so all we're going to do is we're just going to tax them on the deemed price, a deemed price. Uh, it's not an altogether novel theory about taxation that we deem things. It happens to us all the time, and it's legitimate. The Supreme Court struck down both of those. That that made that made Blakeney so mad, it and so upset it was his fixation. We had to deal with that. 
And he had, I think, remarkably little sympathy from the federal government. Uh, and why, th th was there an ideological split? No, uh, the federal government thinks the court is really its bailiwick and they don't really want premiers belly aching about the way the Supreme Court of Canada is provinces. And of course, the, the, the Supreme Court does frustrate provinces. All the rule of law jurisprudence we have is always telling provinces they can't, they can't tax this way, they can't regulate this way, they can't license this way. I mean, it's rule of law is a bur Earlier in this talk, we've talked about how good it is that there is a legal regime that keeps us on this course of common good and that's and enforces legislative matters, and that's the rule of law. And the and, and Trudeau, Trudeau was a rule of law guy. I have a story about that, which we don't have time for, but I'll tell it to you very quickly. At the very first meeting under section 35, whatever the indigenous uh thing. The, the Indigenous uh, Rights Meeting, Ontario in a, set around a memo saying, oh, we're all together. Why don't we just make a constitutional amendment getting rid of section 96? That is getting rid of constitutionally assured rule of law jurisdiction of courts to determine whether tribunals are acting outside their jurisdiction. That's such a pain for us. Those damn courts, they're, they're, they're a bunch of right-wing people that don't let our, our agencies uh, uh, do what they need to do because they're always saying we're, we don't have a statutory base for doing so. Okay, it goes up. Federal government writes a sort of polite memo about it. We all talk about it. It comes to the table, at and I can picture now. This is at the this is at the first of the indigenous things when I was I was in that conference too. Uh, Trudeau looks at his notes. Oh, he says, you know whatever it is, section eight or, or judicial review. What's this, he says, he, like he's like, what is it? He never gets briefed or what, you wonder, what is this? So he reads the thing and he said, but that's, that's against the rule of law. So well, no, 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 it's, it's for, you know, legislative liberty, it'll be good for the people. And he said, it ain't happening. And guess what? We're on to the next item. A, a beautiful, for me, a beautiful, beautiful moment. Um, now, you were asking me about, uh, was I in, in accord? Sometimes I was very much in accord with Trudeau. I was probably in accord with Trudeau. And I, not probably, I was in accord with Trudeau. Uh, and I was out of sync with, with Blakeney. Uh, I absolutely was in accord with Blakeney on economic regulation. Uh, and... Um, I, uh, uh, what, what can I say about it? Yeah, um, I, I was a, I'm tempted to say, I was a good civil servant, but you know, I wasn't. I belly ached and I complained and I, I chipped away all the time. And Blakeney was known to say, shut up, John. He's a smart man. He didn't need a lot of advice from somebody like me, especially when it was wrongheaded. To, 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 to come back again to, uh, to Trudeau and your sort of, I think, partial identification with his, his politics. Um, my, my guess, I'll pr present this to you and then you can tell me if this is right or wrong, but my guess would be that the point at which you slipped out of sync with Trudeau would have been October 1980 and, and his decision to proceed uh, without provincial consent on patriation. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a dramatic moment, um, and um, it was it was I was out of sympathy with that for sure. It's no way to run a federal state. Uh, it can't be the way to run a federal state. Um, you know, politics isn't very happy with messiahs of any sort. Um, and, and Trudeau had this vaguely messianic uh, sense of himself. Uh, vaguely, maybe strongly, I don't know. But uh, uh, he, he was wrong. He, couldn't, he, he, he can't do that. He can't do what he tried to do. <clears throat> what was interesting about that 
uh, that, that happened, I think, on the day before Thanksgiving or two days before Thanksgiving. And next, Tuesday morning, we're all down there in, a, in Toronto in a hotel. Uh, all the provinces, good grief, what's happening? And uh, what's, what's happening is war, except Al Blakeney. Al Blakeney says, maybe we should deal with him. He needs friends. Maybe we should see if we can get at him through a more conciliatory way. So the gang of 10, of course, didn't was never the gang of 10. It wasn't even the gang of eight of provinces. It was the gang of six. And Blakeney wasn't there. And he wasn't there. And he wasn't there. And we engaged in bilateral negotiations with Canada forever and a day. Well, forever a day. All October, November, December, January, and finally, we met to make a deal, and we didn't agree on a deal uh, at the end of the day and um, on something very, very trivial. Um, and uh, we joined the Gang of Eight. And it, this isn't supposed to be a conversation about me, but I gotta say that it was a wonderful moment for me. I, I was in Ottawa all the time on these deals and they all they always bothered me. I mean, I went there, I think every week. I mean, with look, Gleason or Romano and deal, deal, deal. And with Kretien, a, a wonderful guy. And um, and, and then it collapsed. And uh, it was a relief. Why? Because there was now something to do that was had had real heft in liberal democracy. And that is making a nation through a process which legitimated the nation, which reflected the le conditions of legitimacy for a nation. And that's what we did. And we went to the court and it was a great, great, great moment for us to go to the court and to say, no, this is, cannot be the way it happens. It was a wonderful moment to do that. Then it was wonderful to go. Uh, and um, I, I don't, you're not asking this, but I'll tell you something about the, the smallness of events making a difference. We sat in boardrooms in Regina talking about our legal strategy. I and Ken Lissick, the Dean of UBC Law School and a young lawyer named Brian Schwartz talking about how we could do that. And I and Schwartz wanted to argue that Canada was a sovereign nation. And as a sovereign nation now, in all, to all intents and purposes, it needs to act like a multi-jurisdictional sovereign nation and it is a matter of our current law that provinces have to agree. No, you can't find in the text, but what you can find in the text is that we're a nation, that we're a federalism and that we're sovereign. Well, by and large sovereign. And it means that there is a system in which we can be a self-determining nation in the future. And that's what we go in and say, it's a law. It is there in the interstices of everything we know about this country. Don't talk about the damn conventions. It's a law. and. Lissick said, no, no, we can argue convention and we can say there has to be a substantial majority, to which we say, well, is that really the convention? That's the convention, says Lissick. We fight Lissick. This is trivial, it doesn't matter. Romano wants to see me in a hotel bar later that day. And he says, Al and I have said, if you can't agree with Lissick, then you should resign. Well, we agreed with Lissick, of course, because we were doing such wonderful stuff. Why would we leave it? Lissick went to court and he argued. Uh, it's a substantial uh, uh, majority of provinces um, and the federal government. You need to get the consent of, of, of provincial level, federal level. Not, not unanimity, says Lissick. Now, later... Um, the, the, the well-known uh, Newfoundland constitutional lawyer uh, writes saying, 
the Supreme Court of Canada made the worst decision ever made in its life when it said substantial majority of, of provinces because that's not the convention. The convention is unanimity and they, those, those nutcases uh, just made up a new convention out of pure convenience. Uh, I take a different cut at it. They made up a new convention out of a process of constituting a reality. And that's not bad. Uh, and uh, and so what, what I want to say, the small moment is, I thought I was more or less running this litigation and I was thrilled. And a guy from UBC comes in and, and by the way, he had worked with Blakeney for years and Blakeney loved him and trusted him. I want you to behave, John. Lissick is, a, Lissick is running this, a shock to me. But this is a small thing, a big thing. We went to court, Lissick argued that. The court bought it, used it, cited it, decided on it, made it the conventional law of Canada. And it was there when we needed it, which was a nation where, in which we are never going to get unanimity, but we can get a law broad-based consensus about constitutional future. I'm talking about, about, what am I talking about? November 1981. This is a small moment, uh, Blakeney saying, I got these two constitutional lawyers, they're being jerks, or at least one of them is anyway, and I got to put my foot down. And, and I, I, so the causal lay, lay, line from here is actually quite big. Small moment, big consequence. So I'm, I'm going to jump in again. I just want to remind everyone, uh, if you have any questions for John, please post them in the, the Q&A section. Um, I, I want to come now to, uh, I, I guess, the most important part of the process and, and the part of the process that we're mainly here to talk about, which is November 1981. Uh, and I'll put this question as simply as I can. Um, it, it, in what ways was good statecraft evident and lacking in November 1981? Well, have you been at this conference? <laughs> lacking, lacking, and lacking. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to complain that this is an exercise in negativity, but it's. And I'm actually saying it's been an exercise in truth telling, an important truth telling, and. I don't, I am not saying, oh, you went there, you don't know how tough it was, oh, we did what we could. No, I'm saying it lacked, it lacked. And um, was it present uh, at, at all? Yes, it was, it was very much present. And it was present, and I'm gonna choose another small moment. It was present, at the moment that the federal minister of justice saw that he had lost his prime minister in a deeply personal intra-provincial long-standing conflict about the nature of Quebec and what Quebec stands for in Canada. And he had lost his prime minister's sense of I don't know, manipulability. That he knew that he had to step away from the Levesque Trudeau wrangling. By the way, it actually, and Chrétien could tell this, everyone in the block could tell it, this is not wrangling out of which some happy resolution is going to come. This is not bargaining. This is just perverse in your faceness. And uh, so that's good that we, by the way, it's also good that, that he has uh, one great, great friend in the, in, in the provinces, a friend he trusts, a friend he's dealt with on item after item as justice, justice ministers, a friend whose rationality he trusts as far as you can trust anything, and that's Roy Romano. And he says to Roy, what are we going to do? And Roy says, uh, well, I have a piece of paper here, which my guys gave me. Uh, what about this? Fine, says Tretien. Let's see if it will fly. It's the Constitution, Act 1981, on two sides of a piece of paper. Um, 
so um, what am I saying? Was it good statecraft and bad strategy? I want to say that that moment was good statecraft in one way only. People had a basis for trusting each other or not trusting each other, and they acted on it. That must be good statecraft, that you, that you trust the people you trust, and you learn to stay clear of the people you don't trust. That must be really, that's not just statecraft, that's almost everything in life. And, you know, Gretchen, he's the kind of realist, down-to-earth guy who would live by rules like that. Uh, and so that's, I think that's a, that's a great moment. Now, of course, it has the sad consequence because Gretchen also knows that he is cutting Lebec loose, that, that, that he is never going to be a real Quebecer from now on, um, in some, in, in, even in his own internal sense, um, though I doubt if you'd admit it. And that's also good too, of uh, uh, something good happening. It's a, it's, a, it's a sacrifice. It's the sacrifice of a standing with Trudeau. It's a sacrifice of a standing in Quebec. It's, anyway, it's, it's judgment. Uh, what, that, that seems so small, doesn't it? Just to get up from the table and leave the, leave the room and talk, look for Roy and say, have you got any ideas? Got any ideas? Um, it turns out in our history, it's actually quite a big moment of statecraft. We uh, bad, bad statecraft. Listen, the statecraft, the thing is, is, to, is, to, is, I've said this before, is to capture the things that are already constituted, but we don't know it yet. We don't know how deeply committed we have made ourselves be, w willingly or not. And we had constituted the idea of human rights, for sure. And we constituted that as a result of the Second World War, of anti-Semitism, as a result of the Second World War and, and, and Hitler. Uh, we constituted as a result of the American civil rights. We constituted, it was constituted as a reality of democratic life. Um, and there was, in some sense, no doubt that that's where a nation like we, us, had to, had to go. And, and that's good. But what's bad, what's bad is to have um, not wrecking, A, the notwithstanding clause. And, and, you know, is the country divided around this? Let me just be clear. It's horrible. It shouldn't have been there. Oh, OK, we haven't got time to debate that. Uh, um, but but what's also horrible is having put it in there, we actually didn't care enough about its impact on on gender equality. And did we know better than that? Of course, we knew better than that. It wasn't it wasn't it wasn't smart. And and uh, and women's rights people were rightly um, took umbrage over the Achilles heel that was created for gender equality um, by the notwithstanding clause and not didn't seek to remedy it. Um, then we come to indigenous people. And yes, that's poor statecraft. Again, we had constituted a post residential school, more than a post residential, well, there's nothing more than the post-residential school, a post-Indian agent regime. Do you know what government indigenous people relationships fulcrum was for so long? The agent. It was the most patronizing, the most oppressive, the most regressive, the most culturally corrupting, the most minimizing, the most juvenilizing uh, regime in place, and it went on and on and on. I'm not saying it's worse than residential schools, but it was a candidate for evil government uh, being practiced by, I assume, 
good people who are asked to perform an, in an evil regime. And I mean, I'm just making an overall general assumption. People, people start out trying to be good. Um, uh, and um, so that it was over. We knew it was over. We knew that um, by then, we knew that um, the, the, the membership regime that was in place, also complete, comprehensively destructive, uh, had to change. We knew that the Indian agent had to change. Uh, and we knew more than anything else that our ideas, territory, land, resources, and 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 dominion over what it is we have a claim to, dominion is too strong. Just we had a recognition that people had claimed to, and it happened because we overruled St. Cat, we overruled St. Catherine's Millen. I mean, later, you know, well, uh, you know, how many St. Catherine's Millions in 1890? This was in 1980, 70. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court of Canada just, no, it, we, we are not going to follow St. Catherine's Milling anymore. There is an entitlement to ownership attributes. There wasn't title, there wasn't anything fancy. There's ownership attributes and it demands respect in the way that we regulate our resources in this nation. A big moment. It got constituted by the Supreme Court. Uh, and then somehow when it came to making the constitution, we forgot we had done that. Uh, that is, if you go around creating a systematic claim against the state for entitlements, for respect, for participation, for revenues, for sharing, for control, which is what's going on, starting to go on after that decision. I'm actually not giving its name because it slipped my mind of all the, of all the crazy things, the big case in Canada. Um, if you've got all that going on, you've got politics going on. And if you've got politics going on, you've got a need to find a constitutional expression of that political reality. And for some reason, the people at the table said, yeah, well, we might get around to that someday, but not now. So that's, is that, is that a statecraft <laughs> defect? You bet. So that's, and have I talked about the notwithstanding clause? I think I have. Uh, but, you know, th th these are huge, huge problems. They're problems that are immorally avoided. And in that immoral avoidance, probably enable agreement. Not, not the gender one. The gender one has no, no justification. But some of the other things that get avoided, it, 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 it narrowed the field of difference to something small enough that we could come out with some terms of agreement. And it turns out that when you want to develop a regime based on reconciliation, you need a first step and a second step and a third step. You need to recognize that, you know, we don't wake up and say, yeah, you and DRIP, um, you know, the Nations Declaration, Rights of Indigenous People, that's it. No, we creep into the logical conclusions of a logical conclusions from the place we have constituted. And in constituting it, we forgot to constitute it. In the text, so, uh, that is. I'm, I'm going to jump in again, because I think probably we have time for, let's say, another three minutes. And we have a really great question from one of our attendees uh, that I think I'd like to finish with. Um, Why so, anonymity? <laughs> yeah. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> um, so the, the question is, um, you say the statecraft process was lacking in, in November 1981, uh, but the process began many years prior. There were drafts, meetings, attempts to get consensus. 
in the end, patriation had to be done. So what do you specifically think was lacking? I think you've just talked about a lot of those things. Uh, mm -hmm. And can you be specific? What do you think could have uh, been done differently? Well, um, nothing should have been done differently if we couldn't have done what we did do. That seems axiomatic. It was a good thing we did. Uh, so they start with that. Nothing was done wrongly. Um, if, if, if everything that was done and everything that was cut out and all concessions made were absolutely in a causal chain that was essential. I don't, I don't demand perfection. Um, it is uh, the enemy of the good, as we are taught somewhere along the line um, or learned somewhere along the line. And um, uh, so the question is fair. Uh, and, um, but, but we didn't, we didn't need to, um, uh, now, now I want to say, I was going to say not pay attention to the gender equality basis. It's possible, and I don't know the history of this, it's possible the gender equality basis wasn't really on in mind, that it was mobilized, um, as, as the conference was ending or even after the conference and it, you know and 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 uh, and by the way i guess what's good is that um as soon as it's raised oh, there's grumbling uh and and, and uh, there's grumbling and and uh, premiers some premiers including alan blakeney said of course there are three immensely happy sides to this quebec wasn't part of it indigenous rights were not recognized and no regime was put in place in, in recognition and third the gender equality the women's rights people were just ignored uh when when they when 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 we uh put the notwithstanding clause in and i am not going to fight for any of them because i want a constitutional agreement and a constitutional agreement this constitutional agreement won't survive another round of negotiation, even one that's done over the telephone over the next 10 days as we phone back and forth saying, what are we going to do with these complaints? So the answer, my answer is no. No. And no. Tough guy that, Blakeney. Uh, well, lots and lots of premiers said, yes, the women's rights things are, are right. Uh, we'll, um, we, can, we can agree to that. And Blakeney says, no. Uh, I, I'm against opening it. If we open it for one, we'll open it for all. And by the way, I have one. If we open it, then we've got to start recognizing indigenous rights. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to have a clause in there about indigenous people. Damn it, we can't be absolutely silent, absent around the fact that this nation is built on indigenous lands and 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 that it's built on the through the treatment of indigenous people, which was not anything that is very happy in our history and we need to know that there is redress needed and no i won't sign I'm, I'm, I'm probably talking about myself too much in this thing but he called me one saturday afternoon he said john he said i think i live close to the building or something the ledge building he said there are a lot of people outside can you come down uh, we need to decide what we're going to do i went down there were ten thousand women uh, outside where the they must have flown in from all over the country. There weren't 10,000. There were a lot of women there. And they were, um, on Saturday afternoon, summertime Saturday, in November, they were uh, demanding that he accept this. And he got up and he said, yes, I accept it. As soon as the other premiers accept recognition of indigenous rights. It didn't make him popular. But really, the next day, yeah, they said we got to uh, we, we we need to fix that too. So uh, I, I've even forgotten what the question is now. Was this was it 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 happened as it was it in in that way it was a success, and are we am I are critics carping too much about the imperfections? Um, I am going to say no. 
when you engage in a constitutional process, you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention to where you are, who is there with you, what your community needs out of the transactions you're engaged in. And I think that the premiers had this narrowest of visions. Could they get around the Levesque factory factor? Um, could, could they agree to give Al <laughs> his capacity to beat up on uh, tax evading corporate enterprises? We, there were things to focus on for sure. Um, and, uh, and maybe if we tried to do any more, it would have fallen apart. But those who complain that it wasn't quite as good as we deserve as a nation, they're right. Can we be happy it happened? Yes. Can people like me who sat around for a long time being a spectator to this? Uh, should we feel guilty? Probably not. So, so I don't think, it, is the question, why so negative? Why so negative? Because there are negatives. So, so we're technically quite a few moments, uh, well, I was going to say a few moments over, we're, we're quite some minutes over, but uh, I, I could sense that that was going towards a, a perfect climactic point, and I wanted to, 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 to let it go, because I think that's a perfect point to end on. Uh, so unfortunately, we, we are out of time, uh, and I'd just like to extend a huge thank you uh, to Professor White for a conversation that I'm sure everyone found as engaging and as enriching as, as I did. So uh, thank you uh, very much from, uh, well, actually from all of the organizing research centers uh, in, in Alberta, Montreal, Ottawa, and Texas. Uh, so we'll leave it there for the session. I hope you'll all join us for the next session, uh, which I think actually has already started um, on patriation and the power of the state. Uh, so thanks again, uh, and I'll see everybody soon. Uh, and special thanks to Zara and uh, Alina for helping out. Thank you, Richard. It was good. Thank you.